Greetings to you all and welcome. My name is Michael Spath. I'm the Executive Director of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace, a member of the Global Kairos for Justice Coalition and the United Church of Christ Palestine Israel Network. This is the third of four webinars designed for congregational use, digging more deeply into the United Church of Christ 2021 General Synod Resolution passed overwhelmingly with 85% of the vote declaration for a just peace between Palestine and Israel. Our first two webinars dealt with the language of the UCC resolution, calling Israel's oppression of Palestinians sin and apartheid. Next Wednesday, February 2nd, we'll discuss a human rights framework for a political solution. And today, there have been many books and programs about Christian Zionism and the dispensationalist and religious right. Today's webinar is different in that we look at the pervasiveness of Christian Zionism, not only among evangelical churches, but in mainline churches and in American civil religion. So we're fortunate to have as our panelists today, three experts on Christian Zionism. Reverend Alex Awad, Palestinian Christian Alliance for Peace, former pastor of East Jerusalem Baptist Church and retired professor at Bethlehem Bible College, who's coming to us from Thailand where he's welcomed a new granddaughter. So Alex, welcome. Reverend Dr. Peter Miano, founder and executive director of Society for Biblical Studies and a minister in the United Methodist Church. And Reverend Don Wagner, former national program director for Friends of Sabeel North America, author, Presbyterian pastor, and retired professor of Middle East Studies. So welcome to you all. Let's get, right, let's get right into it. I'd like for each of you to weigh in on a couple of theses of mine. The first thesis, when we talk about Christian Zionism and churches, we're dealing with multiple overlapping definitions. One for dispensationalists, the non-dispensationalist Christian right, mainline Protestants, Roman Catholics and Orthodox, African American churches, and others. So since, since we're addressing mainline churches in this program, how would you define Christian Zionism vis-a-vis -vis the mainline church differently than within the evangelical world? What different issues are raised when we deal with mainline Christians and Israel? Alex? Uh, Salam alaikum. Um, and uh, greetings to everyone. Yeah, I uh, personally grew up in uh, the evangelical uh, uh, background. You know, I was um, uh, introduced to evangelicalism by uh, missionaries who came to the Holy Land and who uh, preached and taught. And for a long time, I thought that... Uh, Christian Zionism is an evangelical thing. I mean, what I mean by a long time, since I woke up to uh, uh, Christian Zionism, I thought Christian Zionism is only a part of the evangelical church until, of course, um, I started receiving groups to Bethlehem Bible College and speaking to groups. And then um, also I started traveling in the United States and I found out that uh, uh, Christian Zionism is prevalent and it's widespread in, in many, many uh, mainline denominations. And I did itinerate a lot within United Methodist uh, uh, churches and congregations. And I was amazed at uh, how many United Methodists, especially in the South, uh, are, uh, are fully fully uh, a Christian Zionist. And uh, I have really difficulty because some of these churches um, will shut the doors oh. in uh, my face. And of course, I traveled always with my wife. Uh, they shut the doors and they would not want to uh, welcome us or sponsor us, even though uh, we were their missionaries. And yet we have very difficult time. So I, I saw... Christian Zionism uh, very, very clearly uh, in uh, my denomination, the United Methodist Church. Um, but I thought uh, to start with that it was only 
uh, in the evangelical, in the charismatic churches, in the um, uh, you know Pentecostal churches, uh, Alliance Missionary Alliance Church, and so on. So it was an eye opener for me to see how widespread uh, uh, you know Christian Zionism even within the church, and it is sad to say so. Thank you, Alex. Uh, Peter, uh, you're up next. What, what issues do you think mainline churches have to deal with with regard to Israel? Um, maybe that evangelical church, that might be different than uh, evangelical churches. Well, I th the only difference between Zionism in the mainstream churches and Zionism in fundamentalist or evangelical churches is the style of biblical interpretation. But that style of biblical interpretation has nothing to do with the de uh, definition of Zionism. If we were to define Zionism by the style of biblical interpretation that someone adopts, we would eliminate 80 to 90 percent of all Jewish Zionists. So I operate on a definition of Zionism which applies to not only different denominations of Christians, different uh, segments of uh, the Christian population, but also uh, Jewish people as well. To me, and it's important. To, sorry. And that, and that definition would be? Zionism is a nationalist ide ideology, purely a nationalist ideology. It is not religious at all. And to, uh, to uh, find a Zionist, you have to find somebody who believes, first of all, that there is such a thing as the Jewish people, a distinct phenomenon of peoplehood identified with Jewish people. That's the first thing. The second thing is that a Zionist has to believe that it's natural and required for people, regardless of whether they're Jewish people, whether it's Jewish uh, nationalism, American nationalism, Russian, Italian, doesn't matter. But uh, the, 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 the Zionist believes that the Jewish people must be organized in a nation state with national apparatus, na national institutions, and distinct national boundaries. If they don't have that, they're not Zionists, even if they use the Zionist narrative or, 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 or advance it. And finally, when it comes to Zionism, uh, the, the distinctive feature about Zionist national ideology is that uh, in addition to the organization of the Jewish people in a distinct national state um, as a historical or political requirement uh, for Zionism, it's also considered a moral imperative, a form of uh, restitution. Thank you, Those Peter. Three things. Thank you very much for that. Don? Um, let me give you just a real simple definition of Christian Zionism that I've used. Uh, and that is that Christian Zionism provides Christian political support for Zionism in the state of Israel. I'd like to sharpen that it's political and it's support for Zionism in the state of Israel. Now you can tweak that with the different evangelical fundamentalists. I prefer to use fundamentalists for the dispensationalists and the Pentecostal and the others. When you get into the main line, I think it's my friend Mark Braverman who said, Christian Zionism in the mainline churches is Christian Zionism hiding in plain sight. And it's more of a, more of a focus on the Holocaust and anti-Semitism. It it's more of an ethical and a moral framework that uh, catches people and uh, calls them into a defense of Zionism in the state of Israel. The Bible is used, of course, to justify that, but I think the major framework is anti-Semitism and, uh, and defense of the state of Israel as the answer to the Holocaust. Uh, and I, I also want to add, you will also find, maybe not so much in the UCC, but a lot of dispensationalists and people uh, who are more evangelical uh, Christian Zionists uh, in the mainline churches. We certainly have a boatload of the Presbyterians, the Methodists, and particularly when you look at the internationals. So don't dismiss that. But uh, the mainline is more of a post-Holocaust uh, ethical theology. 
Thank, thanks for that. Uh, we'll we'll return to that uh, um, in in a few minutes. But I want to I want to try out my second thesis uh, for you, and that is this: uh, Zionism is to Judaism as manifest destiny is to Christianity. That is, after the enlightenment with the rise of secularism and nationalist movements, the expansion the expansionist elements of both Judaism and Christianity traditionally grounded in theology were reinterpreted within secular colonial frameworks for Judaism as Zionism and Christianity's great commission became manifest destiny shorn of theological language. What do you think of that thesis? Uh, Don first and then Alex and then Peter. Well, I tend to agree with that and uh, tweak it a little bit. I think you can draw a line from really the Crusades, Doctrine of Discovery, uh, and, and then the rise of settler colonialism uh, and colonialism in, in the West. And Christian Zionism and Zionism really embrace all of that. And as a, nation, as, as a form of nationalism, uh, Zionism is kind of a blood nationalism. Uh, Israel for the Jews, just like Germany for the Germans. So it's, it's, it's a tribal form of nationalism. Uh, so when you combine that with the settler colonial ideology and the empire backing it, uh, which you've had from the Brits to the US, you got a real lethal mix. And uh, so I would add those elements to it, Mike. And settler colonialism, remember, uh, is different from typical traditional colonialism because the settler colonialists don't leave. They stay and remove the indigenous as we did in this country. Thanks, Don. Alex? Yeah, I totally agree with Don because when you read the history of the Puritans, uh, you know, coming to the United States, you know, wanting so much uh, uh, religious liberty and freedom for themselves, but at the same time claiming that uh, uh, they um, were sent by God to uh, North America to possess the land just uh, the same in the same manner that the Jewish people went to Palestine and possessed the land during the time of Joshua and so on. So you, you can see a, a biblical parallel that uh, uh, the, the uh, early uh, pilgrims and immigrants uh, to, the, uh, to North America, uh, they, they came up with this uh, uh, Zionistic motifs and, uh, and they believed that they are the, the new Israel, uh, but later on, uh, uh, they, they became very sympathetic with the idea of creating a Jewish state in Palestine. And uh, these uh, uh, early Puritans were some of the earliest people who started calling for the creation of a Jewish state in Palestine. Thank you, Alex. Peter? Uh, well, thanks to Don and Alex for your, your, uh, your, your answers, which I appreciate and agree with. I would stress more, emphasize more the, the nature of Zionism as a nationalist ideology, uh, and all nationalist ideologies require narratives to legitimate the, 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 the concept of nationalism or, the, con or the, the reality of the nation state. So manifest destiny for Americans, whether we're Christian or no matter what kind of Americans we are, is part of the nationalist ideology used to, to create the concept of a distinct people desiring and needing and requiring a distinct nation state. So it's, it's part of the legitimization process. Uh, it, 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 and and they, they all use some sort of nationalist mythology, which then becomes, which they invent, but then becomes uh, 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 you know, uh, endorsed or uh, made real when people buy into it. We might return to that a little bit later, uh, but I, I want to shift gears a little bit now uh, um, and return to a, a, a theme that you mentioned in, the, in answer to the first question. Theologically, Christian Zionism holds that the people of Israel continue to be significant for the history of redemption and that the land 
of Israel is at the heart of God's eternal covenant with Israel, and as such is critical to the unfolding of God's purpose for the world. In the 2020 document, Cry for Hope, Palestinian Christians declare, quote, we believe that our land has a universal mission. So my question is, what would a, a Christian theology of the land look like? Peter? That's a tough question. I, I, yeah. you know, I wouldn't want to promote a Christian theology of the land, personally. Um, and I think for getting back to your original question, or maybe Don's answer to the question, um, Yeah, I, I guess uh, 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 th this is a difficult this is a difficult question. Sorry, uh, but I would want to avoid any sort of theology of the land. I think uh, I think mainstream Christians are distinct from fundamentalist or evangelical Christians by you know uh, de-emphasizing uh, the role of theology or biblical theology in legitimating nationalist ideology. It's not necessary for, for, uh, for Reinhold Niebuhr, for example, and Donna's going to talk a lot more about this, but it's not, not necessary for Reinhold Niebuhr to have a biblical or theological uh, theology of the land. It's a moral, uh, a moral imperative for him, and he does see the Jewish people as distinct, even though he's thinking only of European Jews and not, not uh, Eastern Jews or Arab Jews, whatever you want to call them. Um, uh, so it, it's, it's, you know, I, I think for mainstream Christians, a theology of the land is, maybe it occurs in some places with some people. I think it's de-emphasized, and personally, I don't think it's necessary or desirable. Thanks for that, Peter. I realize it's a difficult question because I, I think that's kind of what our Palestinian Christian friends were trying to get to when they, when they talked about the land having universal mission and not so not so tribal and focused. Uh, um, so thanks for that. Let, let's uh, ask uh, Don to weigh in. Don? Well, just a couple things. I think Peter touched on it, but I think when you sacralize the land and make it holy, um, you, that's where you begin to go down the road of exclusivity, particularity, and so on. And uh, I wish we could stop calling it the holy land. Absolutely. Uh, you know, just st <laughs> in my book, I'm playing with the title uh, Journeys to the Unholy Land. You know, it, it's, it isn't holy. It isn't particularly sacred. And there's a lot of uh, injustice going on there. So that would be one thing. And then when you get a, uh, you know, kind of a more tribal nationalism attached to this uh, holy land, you, you got a lethal problem. So uh, the religious uh, dimension of this, it really scrambles it. So you've got to cut through and critique all that with, with uh, saying it's, you know, God intends for people to live in community, in harmony. Uh, so to universalize the land is it. And Jesus certainly does that. You know, he's deconstructing all the way through uh, so uh, the land is for all of us. Jesus had nowhere to lay his head. Uh, and that didn't matter because he was there for everybody and particularly for the poor. So uh, I think to universalize the issue and, and to put an emphasis on the marginalized and our responsibility for equality and justice for the marginalized today, the Palestinians. Alex? Well, you know, this uh, is... Uh like Peter said, it's a very difficult question to answer. But for us uh, uh, Palestinians, it is an existential uh, you know, question because what, uh, what uh, Christian Zionists believe about the land is a threat to our very existence. And uh, we were cornered as Palestinian Christians uh, to, to try to respond to the question, uh, who does the land belong to? 
And uh, so many of our professors at Bethlehem Bible College, they wrote uh, books focusing on the question, uh, you know, of the land, the land in the Bible, the, the land in the perspective of Jesus, the land in the perspective of the prophets and so on. But, uh, but Christian Zionists and all the guests that came to, to hear uh, our lectures, they forced on us to really uh, create what I would uh, call, and maybe some of you would object to this, a, a theology of the land. But our theology of the land is totally um, uh, universal, that we believe that the land belongs to everybody. Uh, and we believe that the whole world uh, is holy land and not just a little place called Palestine or Israel or whatever you want to call the land. But uh, certainly we looked very, very carefully uh, into the New Testament and we realized if from the New Testament that uh, 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 the concept of no, 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 the no, land no, no. is not uh, no, no. so much uh, no, uh, just... uh, geography and territorial, but rather that it is spiritual. Let's return to, uh, th thank you, uh, guys. Let's return to uh, uh, a comment that came up uh, earlier in one of the answers. And that is uh, um, uh, interfaith relations, especially with the Jewish people. You know, many mainline congregations and their pastors pride themselves on significant positive relationships with neighboring synagogues and rabbis, which often lead to what our friend Mark Ellis calls the interfaith deal and which our friend Mark Braverman deals with in his uh, uh, wonderful book, Fatal Embrace. How do these relationships color mainline church interpretations of the Hebrew Bible, the history of the Jewish people, especially post-Holocaust, and even their politics, their politics regarding Israel? And can you give some advice to pastors uh, who are having to navigate these uh, difficult conversations in these relationships with their Jewish uh, counterparts? Alex? Uh, thank you for asking this question. It's very, very important because uh, I've been part of uh, many of these uh, interfaith uh, dialogues, uh, Muslims, Christians, and Jews coming together and, uh, you know, uh, enjoying a meal together and uh, having nice, you know, uh, sweets and cakes and drinks and toasting and uh, dancing, the hula and the dabka and uh, whatever you call it. But, uh, you know, um, uh, th then if you ask the question, what about Palestine? What's happening in Palestine? What about injustice in Palestine? Then everything drops. You know, it's like, uh, it's like this is a taboo. You don't go there. So uh, my advice, uh, any interfaith dialogue that does not address uh, what is happening in the Holy Land, the injustice that's happening in the Holy Land is not worth going to. And I said that to many rabbis who called me into a dialogue. I said, uh, you know, uh, as, as long as the dialogue uh, is willing to address real issues, uh, what's happening on the streets of Jerusalem and Hebron and uh, Gaza, if you are not willing to deal with this, I don't want to be part of that uh, uh, interfaith dialogue. Um, Peter? Peter, you're muted. There, how's that? Good. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I was just saying uh, I appreciated Alex, uh, Alex's uh, response. Um, I would say personally that, first of all, it's, it's important to build relationships with people across ideological uh, divides. Uh, but they're really, I, I would want to remind my, my, uh, my Christian brothers and sisters who are interested in repairing uh, a fraught relationship with their Jewish friends um, and colleagues, that there really is no relationship where there's not frank speech. 
there can't be relationship where there are sort of uh, no fly zones, uh, where we enter the conversation only uh, if we comply with the requirements of one party to the dialogue. And especially if that party eliminates conversation about certain areas, these are the no-fly zones I'm talking about. Palestine is one of them, especially in Christian uh, Jewish dialogue. Much of Christian Jewish dialogue is predicated on the, uh, the contract that we will not discuss this issue. That means to me that there really is no relationship. Relationship, whether it's parent, child, husband, wife, pastor, parish, all around relationship requires uh, candid, direct speech. Uh, and without it, there's not relationship at all. So when people require it of us, they're really requiring us to submerge moral issues in this case that, that uh, uh, you know, I, I, I can't do it. Personally, I can't be involved in that sort of thing. My, my original uh, exposure to and my original, when I first started to sniff the concept of mainstream Christian Zionist, Zionism is when I was studying with uh, Anthony Salderini at Boston College, who is uh, one of the prominent New Testament professors, uh, uh, scholars of the 20th century, who, when I mentioned the idea that Israel was a colonizing state, uh, shut down all the conversation about it at all, at, at entirely. So that, I mean, he's obviously not a biblical fundamentalist, he's not a dispensationalist, but he refused to allow any conversation about Israel if it involved the word colonization. I didn't, I didn't bring up the, the, the concept of apartheid at that time, I didn't make the connection, um, but it's the same sort of a thing. There cannot be, and his issue was that if we start talking like that, it'll rupture our relationships with our, with our Jewish friends. Well, if, if that's what happens, they're not friends. Mm -hmm. There has to be space in a real strong, uh, mature relationship for fraught conversation, for tortured conversation about life and death issues. And colonization always requires racism, always uh, involves uh, expulsion, uh, uh, ethnic cleansing uh, to a greater or lesser extent. But if we can't point those things out and name them, we don't really have a relationship with those people to begin with. Thank you, Peter. Don? Well, I don't have much to add. Um, just to say that as a young pastor fresh out of seminary, I was very much a mainline Christian Zionist. So my first church was a black church, and we were involved with, uh, with a synagogue. So I know how difficult it is, and I know how I kind of gave the conversation over and let let the rabbi drive the conversation on the issues. But uh, I learned later, you know, I got to be completely transparent when I've seen the light after going uh, to Palestine. And uh, as Peter and Alex said, I've got to be fully transparent on the justice issues. I'm not going to let, let them uh, check Palestine at the door and say, let us deal with it. Uh, we Jews know how to deal with the Palestinians. No, I want to have that conversation and see if I can move that relationship deeper. And if I can't, then, uh, then I have to walk away. And I'd also say, you know, there are multiple Jewish friends. And uh, I mean, we got friends, uh, rabbis who might be anti-Zionist or who are Zionist and very pro-Palestinian. There are many other Jews that we can maintain strong conversations with who are in different places, uh, including BDS, which is one of the most difficult ones these, th these days. So I'd add that to it too. Yeah, if, uh, if I can add, uh, um, Michael, I mean, they have so many red flags. Like if, if, you, uh, if you have any sympathy towards Hamas, if you are uh, sympathetic towards the BDS movement, you know, uh, they, they have those red flags. And if you bring them to the, dis bring these things to the discussion, then in my experience, that will be the end of the discussion. And uh, the rabbi or uh, whoever is conducting the meetings will just end everything. So that happened to me quite often. Thank you.
I want to continue with this theme of interfaith relations. <clears throat> I want you to say a word about how this impacts uh, an understanding of Islam, how Christian Zionism uh, impacts an understanding of Islam and its role in history. Christian Zionism, it seems to me, also has an Islamophobic aspect to it. Um, so say a word about that. Uh, Don? Yeah, it absolutely does, particularly in the evangelical realm. Um, <clears throat> you know, it, it demonizes Islam. And uh, yeah, my God, I'm, I'm married to a Muslim wife and I've been uh, declared, uh, you know, persona non grata by many evangelicals for that. Um, but I'd rather have the love and the joy that we share together. Um, so there is kind of that, I think, rather shallow demonization. And this goes way back in history. Luther himself was extremely Islamophobic. And this, you can see this thread running through uh, Protestant theology. And it seeps into the main line. So we, we really have to overcome that. And I think there's so much common ground we have uh, with Islam. And, and to build those relationships is, is really important. I mean, Islam accepts Jesus, a form of the second coming. Mary is central in Islam. So uh, we have tremendous uh, groundwork for dialogue, exchanges, more or less, but also the strong sense of justice and building fellowship. Are, are extremely important. So I think uh, we need to really cultivate that. And it's, uh, it's a wide open field and we need to do a lot better. And we need to get so we are standing with the Muslims when they are vilified, just as we'll stand with the Jews when anti-Semitism rises. Thank you, Don. Alex? Yeah, I just uh, fully, fully agree with uh, Don uh, on this issue. I mean, uh, uh, Muslims uh, have been beaten up all over uh, by Christian Zionists, you know, um, uh, and uh, it is so sad. I remember one time uh, I was at Bethlehem Bible College when a, um, a group came and among them was a Christian Zionist and he looked at uh, the wall and uh, on the wall um, of the Bible College there was a um, a, a nice calligraphy of uh, the Lord's Prayer, Avan al uh, fi samawat It's beautiful Arabic uh, calligraphy. And uh, as soon as he saw that, he was so upset and he started, uh, you know, screaming and shouting at us because he assumed that it was a Quranic verse. It's a verse from the Quran because it was in Arabic and it was in beautiful calligraphy. He assumed it was Quranic and so he was so upset and so mad at us why we as a Bible college would have uh, anything to do with Islam and uh, it is so unnerving and, and so upsetting. But that simple example shows a history of Islamophobia within the evangelical uh, churches and many of the mainline uh, denominations and we need to fight this. And we need to reach out to our Muslim brothers and sisters because they are uh, partners in this war for justice for uh, both Israelis and Palestinians. Peter. I would say that uh, to the extent that Christian Zionism is Islamophobic or anti-Islam, it is so because Western culture is Islamophobic and anti-Islam. So before uh, that Islamophobia enters into the conversation of Christian Zionism. It's already present in Western culture, going back to the time of Herodotus, who referred to the people of the East as barbarians. Alexander the Great's conquest reinforces that. And you can trace uh, anti-Eastern, uh, uh, what's the word, uh, prejudice, uh, stereotyping from that time all the way down and uh, down to today. Uh, Edward Said refers to it as uh, Orientalism. So it's, it's in Christian Zionism because it's already embedded in, Christ in Western culture. Well, you brought up the key word that I wanted to uh, ask about, uh, Peter, and that's Orientalism. Um, uh, Alex, you're a Palestinian Christian. 
And uh, I'm thinking about in our education materials in the mainline church from mainline church publishing houses, right? For both children and adults, there's often what I would call an Orientalist romanticization of Palestine and Israel, and even uh, an anti what uh, Eastern uh, perspective, which removes which removes it from history, even as Don referred earlier to calling it Holy Land. Uh, that does it in this way. As you know, most pilgrimages only want the holy sites. They don't want the biblical pictures in their minds sullied by the reality on the ground. And I'm going to ask Peter later to talk about pilgrimages. Uh, but for right now, let's focus on uh, uh, our educational materials as we teach the Bible to adults and Bible stories to kids. How can we do the, a better job to dispel these romanticized orientalist notions? Uh, Alex, you first. Yeah, I, I would say um, education is the key to combat uh, uh, racism, uh, whether it is racism against um, um, Palestinians, against Arabs, against Muslims, against the people in the Orient. Not only this, many uh, tourists come to the Holy Land and they want to do nothing with Christians, if they happen to be Catholic or Greek Orthodox or Assyrian or Armenian or any other Christian. So uh, racism is so uh, prevalent in, uh, um, in the mind of uh, many Western people. And so I, I would say uh, that uh, the secret is education and also um, the concept of come and see, come and see the Holy Land and uh, come and see all the uh, rainbow pictures of the Holy Land, the different colors, the different cultures, the different societies, uh, the, the rich heritages in every church and in every mosque and in every synagogue. So it's a beautiful country with beautiful land, beautiful history, but we need to be open to that. And we, we need to introduce it into our uh, curriculums, in our teachings, uh, especially uh, in church, uh, in church, in Sunday school, uh, books and leaflets and so on, give a very positive uh, picture of uh, the people and the cultures of the Middle East. Peter, I'm going to ask you in just a couple minutes to really expand upon pilgrimage. So I don't want you to do that now, but talk to us about the educational materials and how we can do a better job in uh, 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 promoting a, a, a better picture of Palestine and Israel through, our, uh, through the Bible's eyes for our mainline churches. Well, I mean, it's, it's fundamental, uh, you know, it's, it's giving biblical study authenticity. It just comes down to genuine biblical study, not selective uh, uh, preferential uh, biblical study. Uh, but the problem is rampant throughout the, 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 uh, all the churches, not just mainstream churches, but all the churches. But this is where you find it in mainstream churches. And just for an, one little example of the way, you know, sometimes mm. I, I think that we forget the power of language sometimes. And the words that we use repeatedly over and over tend to reinforce uh, a bias in favor of Jewish people and in favor of, of Israel. So we don't de deconstruct the language adequately for our con congregations. One small example, which may be uh, a controversial small example, is we need to stop using the term Jew for Jesus, his disciples, his people, and anybody that lived in the first century, uh, you know, Judea, Samaria, Galilee. Uh, every time we do that, not only do we reinforce, um, not only do we reinforce uh, the idea uh, that the Jewish people are returning to their historic land, which is one of the fundamental presuppositions of the Zionist narrative, uh, we also reinforce uh, uh, anti-Jewish uh, uh, Christian anti-Jewishness. So by just eliminating, and it's not, it's not, tra there is no, uh, just translating the terms eudaios and eudaioi in our Bibles from the Greek uh, 
text to Jews and Jewishness or Jews and, and Jew distorts the, the historical context and does damage to uh, the way in which people uh, uh, see the relationship between modern Israel and uh, the, the ancient people that lived there. Thank you. Don? Uh, Edward Said wrote a, <clears throat> an article titled Permission to Narrate. And just that idea, it gets, we've got to get at the narrative that's dominant. And Zionism tends to dominate the narrative, just as our Western American uh, culture dominates the narratives. And this comes through with a lot of our uh, educational materials in the churches. Um, so I think to critique that and contextualize the Bible and allow Palestinian theologians and everyday Palestinians, other Arab Christians, Coptic Orthodox and whatnot, uh, to enter the uh, space of our educational material is really important. So uh, I, I think we really need to uh, critique our narrative, uh, shift the frame, and expand it to allow these other voices from the Holy Land elsewhere in the Middle East also to, to see the threads we have in common with our black, brown, and indigenous peoples, uh, that introduces another thread that ties into the Palestinian struggle. So uh, these are some of the ways that we can shift the narrative and not allow it to be so monochromatic, uh, whether Zionist or Western. Peter, you gave a, a wonderful example, uh, just uh, how language is so important. And I, I want to I want to ask the three of you to comment about another example in the way we talk about the issue. Talk about the bold straight line that Christian Zionism draws between biblical Israel and the present secular nation state of Israel. So, Israel, you know, uh, a, a, as a, a term that's used. And why that's not only theologically heretical, but dangerous. Um, Don, you want to take that? And then Peter and then Alex. Well, I'll kick it off. Yeah. Israel of the Bible is not the modern state of Israel. The modern state is a secular uh, state created by the United Nations. There's no reference to that kind of a state in the Bible. There are four uses uh, of, the, of Israel in the Bible, and uh, John Stott, that great evangelical, itemized these, and it's not a modern state. So we need to separate these ideas and, and deconstruct it. The, uh, you know, Israel is a secular uh, Zionist state, and it does have religious implications and religious defenses, but we always need to deconstruct it and we need to face it in terms of in how international law deals with things. And then you know, Jesus does a great job. Just use Jesus as our hermeneutic when we're looking at Israel, the land, uh, the temple and everything else and not allow us to sacralize the land or that state. So that's our challenge. Thanks, Don. Peter. I, I, uh... You know, I agree with everything I hear from Don and Alex, and this is a great learning experience for me, too, to hear how other people articulate similar ideas. Uh, but I would point out to people that there is no nation state. There was no nation state at the time of Jesus in the time of the Bible. The concept of a nation state uh, doesn't arise before the 19th century. Uh, so to project onto biblical texts a modern concept is just anachronistic. It's poor historiography. In the Bible, Israel is not a place. It's a people. When it's meant to refer to a place, it's always modified in the Hebrew texts as the land of Israel. But Israel is a people. Uh, when Jesus says after he uh, restores the centurion's slave to useful purpose, which is slavery, you know, note that Jesus does not say uh, there's no more slavery here. He never challenges slavery. He restores the slave, the centurion in Luke chapter seven to proper use. And then he, he congratulates the centurion saying, 
not ever, not, nowhere in the house of Israel have I seen such faith. When he's saying house of Israel, he's referring to a people, not a place. So it's important to make that distinction that just uh, uh, using the Bible that way to, to uh, 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 legitimate a modern state is just incorrect biblical interpretation. It's just naive. It's childish. Thank you. <laughs> Tell us what you think, uh, Peter. Uh, Alex. Well, I think the genius of the Zionist movement is absolutely you know, is to get that word Israel uh, as a label for this state that they formed in uh, 1948, because they knew how touchy this would be for Christians around the world. All of us, when we say uh, Noel, 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 born is the king of Israel. <laughs> you know, just one, just one example of our, uh, uh, you know, Christmas uh, uh, songs. Um, but, uh, uh, but definitely I agree with Dan and Peter that, uh, uh, you know, the, the current state of Israel is a settler colonial entity uh, that uh, forced itself upon uh, the Middle East and the Arab world, and uh, it, it created havoc on all of us. Uh, I mean, uh, I personally suffered so much because the creation of the state of Israel in 1948 made me uh, lose my father, who was killed in the first Arab-Israeli war, and made seven of us children refugees with my mother. So it's, it's, it's a, in my opinion, you know, I mean, you may not agree with me, but this is a terrorist state and uh, I will not, never give it the legitimacy or even, I, I don't even like uh, to uh, give it the name Israel at all. Thank you. We're going to come to uh, talking about hymns and prayers and liturgy in a few minutes, but I do want to I do want to take up this topic that was brought up earlier about pilgrimage. And Peter, I'm going to start with you. Your Society for Biblical Studies, to quote from your website, seeks quote to redeem the idea of pilgrimage from commercial sightseeing and to restore an understanding of authentic pilgrimage as a learning and spiritual exercise grounding biblical scholarship within its historical and cultural context. So I want you to say a word about so-called Holy Land tours that reinforce a Christian Zionist perspective and how authentic pilgrimage can lead to a more gospel-centered understanding. Well, thank you. I'll, I'll try. Um, first of all, it's a very important topic. And, uh, you know, the, the, the idea or the, the reality of Christian pilgrims in the Holy Land is, is, uh, is, a, is an area that is very poorly understood. Over 97% of all tourists to Israel are on Christian pilgrimage or what are called Christian pilgrimage. They really, in my mind, it's not pilgrimage. It's commercial sightseeing, high volume commercial sightseeing, plain and simple. And the main reason that it does not become pilgrimage is that for those 90, you know, 98% of the tourists that go to Israel, Christian tour, or, or the Christians that go to Israel, um, it does not involve associating the biblical, uh, biblical literature, the biblical theology or biblical morality to contemporary contexts. In other words, it, it, uh, it sanitizes um, uh, it, it's not pilgrimage at all because it doesn't involve meeting indigenous people, whether they're Israelis or Palestinians, without, uh, without involving people who actually live there, there's no way for people to begin to understand the moral imperatives of the Bible. You can visit all the archaeological sites you want, and that's important. And I'm not one of these people that denigrates uh, holy sites as, as dead stones. Uh, they're not dead stones for people who are who are enlivened by uh, uh, feeling closer to Jesus, for example. Uh, but without you, without actually meeting people, people like Alex and Bashara, uh, people like Father Shakur, and the millions of Palestinians that live there that are not as uh, that don't have the name rec recognition that uh, that that that, that th those ones do. But without meeting them, you cannot find out their stories, and then you can never make an association between what you're learning with what's actually going on in the world today. Uh, the Bible is relevant. 
And in order to discover the relevance and the, the uh, exigence of the Bible, you have to meet indigenous people. Most commercial, all commercial tourism sanitizes a trip to the Holy Land, uh, insulates the travelers from any kind of exploration of moral implications and moral uh, crises. And, you know, I mean, ha, ha, it, it's inconsistent with the concept of, of, uh, of pilgrimage because ha, how, do you, how do you walk where Jesus has walked without walking where Jesus is walking today? How do you follow the one that said, blessed is the peacemakers, blessed are the peacemakers, without finding out what peacemaking actually means in that particular context? And by the way, that's not the only context in which peacemaking is required. So not learning what peacemaking it is and how relevant, and how uh, 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 imperative the gospel message is to the world today. Uh, it, 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 it's just, uh, it, it, it's not pilgrimage at all. It's not a spiritual, it's not challenging anybody. It's not opening anybody up to, to new, uh, uh, new applications. And therefore, when they come back uh, and everybody returns to their, their home country eventually, uh, but when they do, uh, their, their trip to, to Palestine is a memory. There's no real life application. There are no imperatives placed on me to uh, make a difference, to do something with what I learned. Uh, and those opportunities are around us everywhere. We live in a country which is deeply divided. Families are deeply divided. Churches are deep. You know, we, we can't say, uh, we can't have conversations about Israel in a lot of our churches because we're so deeply divided, but the whole point of the, the gospel message is to restore, in my opinion, to restore relationship, to rebuild community, to establish community on an entirely different uh, uh, level than most people uh, do today. I hope I tried, well, I tried to answer the question. No, thank you, Peter. And, and I mean, this is, this is your life's work. And so uh, I, I appreciate very much uh, the passion which you bring to the answer. Don, you, you've led scores of these pilgrimages, uh, authentic pilgrimages, uh, um, uh, visiting with uh, peacemakers and justice advocates. Uh, what are your thoughts? Well, I mean, I'll yield to Peter and uh, you know try to be brief here. Uh, I think one of the goals we should have is to allow people to build relationships and make connections uh, with the people of the land and let them see the whole wide spectrum, settlers to Palestinians involved in resistance, to pastors, uh, to students and young people. You know, there's so many young Palestinians now uh, that are vibrant and really articulate. Um, one of my passions was to get people to see the injustices and see how people are trying to turn that around as a form of resistance. So what's happening now in Sheikh Jarrah and Silwan, to go there, to go to the Tent of Nations, Wadi Fukin, and really see and experience the context, the struggle, but also how people are trying to make a living and survive. It's very, very important. And not just glorify also all of the top leaders I mean, just for the normal person to go to school, go to their job, let people walk through a checkpoint with them, uh, experience the oppression, so they really have an existential feeling of what the Palestinians are feeling. And then finally, to help work with, to work with people so they're going to do something when they go home, do something for justice, whether it's pray, call your legislator, get involved in demonstrations, join a uh, organization that's doing the resistance, like our PIN networks, so that there's a continuity. I think I always failed at that. Uh, some work, maybe you're lucky to get 10% of the people who really follow up. So I think we really need, need to work more with that and the uh, orientation on the front end. Those go together. Thank you, Don. Alex, I'm going to come to you in just a second. I want you to weigh in as a Palestinian Christian uh, from Bethlehem, but Don has to leave in a few minutes, and I wanted Don to uh, to ask you. So we're going to put pilgrimage on, on hold just for a second. Don, I, I'd like for you to say a word about something that you've been writing about more recently and then, any, and then any other closing thoughts that you'd like to share. So you've written a lot about Reinhold Niebuhr's Christian, nihilism, uh, Christian realism and his support for pro-Zionist causes. 
So can you talk to us a little bit about how his how you see his lingering influence on theology in mainline churches? Anything else you'd like to say theologically? And then closing thoughts. And oh thanks. You. Thank you, Don. I know. I know. Uh, have at well, it. First, thank you, Mike, and all the rest of you in um, UCC. Your resolution last summer and what you are doing is absolutely critical. And I think it spills over into setting a model, uh, a high bar for other denominations. Yes. So as Presbyterians, we're going to try to catch up with you. But uh, I think, thank you. Just thank you for this and where this may go from there. Uh, in terms of Niebuhr, he was one of my heroes in seminary where I transitioned from an evangelical to a mainline uh, Protestant liberal, uh, in a sense. I even hate those titles. But Niebuhr was really central for me. Uh, and I just fell into, not so much with his influence, but with my experiences in the black church and the need to repent to the Jewish community for burning down some of the Jewish stores in Newark. I was in that context. So we twinned with a synagogue. Uh, and so I was very deep in this liberal Christian Zionism for a while. And uh, Niebuhr really, um, Set a, set a model. I mean, he basically led a lobby, uh, had big influence on Truman, and uh, he really saw the Holocaust as a transformative event, and anti-Semitism is this deep sin, and he was right. But there was a blindness that Niebuhr settled into uh, to the point where he had no sense or compassion of the Palestinian suffering. You know, it was like Nakba denial, which is a new theme that's going on. He was actually informed that, hey, there's massacres that are taking place, that the Zionist militias in the state of Israel are conducting, conducting now. And he basically said, well, maybe the Arabs will have to go to other countries like Iraq. And evidently someone else had that formula. So he was proposing that. So the suffering of the Palestinians and the Nakba and beyond was a non-issue. It was overridden by his dedication to Zionism and to that particular narrative. So uh, I, I think there's a lot of lessons there. I mean, he's a great theologian, not to belittle him, but on this issue, uh, it was really a big disappointment. And it's a lesson for us of... Uh, of, of not looking at the marginalized, the suffering once the state is created. So I'll end with that. Any other closing thoughts you'd like to make, Don, in general for us? Well, I think uh, another thing that we haven't raised too much is the importance of intersectionality, of dealing with questions like race, apartheid, with our African-American, our black sisters and brothers, brown, and our indigenous people. And I think um, uh, Christian Zionism uh, plays a devious role in all of this. Uh, so I think uh, opening that whole discussion up is, is very important. So I'd just like to close with that challenge. So thank you again. I'm sorry to have to leave. And thank you for everyone and for what you will do and the cause in the future. Well, Don, Thanks. we're uh, we're we're grateful to you for your lifelong witness. We're looking forward to uh, uh, your book when it comes out uh, in a couple of months. We had the pleasure of interviewing you a couple of times about your uh, manuscript, and blessings to you and Linda, and with gratitude for your work. And Thank we'll you so much, everybody. Now. All bye right, bye. bye, Don. Alex, uh, thanks for that tangent. Uh, uh, Don had to go. So we're back to pilgrimage, Alex. Uh, your family comes from Bethlehem. You taught at Bethlehem Bible College, pastor in East Jerusalem. From your context as a Palestinian Christian, talk to us about authentic pilgrimage. Well, first of all, I want to uh, uh, say thank you to Don, even though he left us. I hope he'll hear the recording later. And to Peter Miano, because when I was uh, teaching at Bethlehem Bible College, both Peter and Don um, uh, used to come with groups to Bethlehem Bible College and ask me to give lectures to the groups. And um, it, it, it has been uh, very, very powerful because 
I myself learned a lot as I, uh, you know, not only spoke to these groups, but heard their questions and also tried to respond to their questions. And so I, I really appreciate uh, both Don, Peter and others maybe here that have brought uh, groups to Bethlehem Bible College for me to speak to. Uh, but uh, it's, it's very important. I, I remember a United Methodist Bishop, a, a African-American Bishop uh, from the state of Oklahoma. He came with a big group to Bethlehem Bible College and they asked me to give a lecture. And while I was giving the lecture, there was a lot of tension because within the group, there were a, a lot of anger. Like they were saying to the bishop, why did you bring us here to listen to, to this uh, BS? You know, I mean, they, they were very, very angry with the bishop for for bringing them here uh, to Bethlehem Bible College and for me to speak uh, to them. And, and that continued. And the bishop, he, his defense was, you've been with an Israeli tour guide for the last six days. And the Israeli tour guides, he gave you all the propaganda. And now we only have 45 minutes with this Palestinian. So, be, be patient and, and listen to the other side. And, and this is uh, why it is so important for uh, Christian groups to come to the Holy Land and to, to listen to all the sides, to the Israeli side, to the Palestinian side, to the settlers, to Muslims, Christians, to uh, also many Israelis who are uh, uh, doing such a great job on human rights issues. Um, and I would like to say that many people who have listened to us, they came on these groups, they went back totally changed uh, when they got to their country and they became very, very strong advocates for peace and justice. So uh, yes, if, if the tours are done in the right way, they can produce a, a lot of good results. I only have, thank you, Alex. I only have a couple more questions. I know that our time is short, uh, but I don't want to leave this without talking about uh, liturgy and prayer and hymns. What happens on, on Sunday mornings in, in churches? Um, can you give, Peter, uh, can you address this uh, at least to start? Can you give some examples of how the liturgy and hymns and prayers shape mainline churches' view of Israel? I can try. I, I think, uh, you know, I, I haven't been in parish uh, ministry in 30 years now, uh, but and we've touched on a few of the items. And I mentioned the way in which we translate the Greek words eudaios and eudaioi, for example, that we uh, I, I, somebody started singing uh, born is the king of Israel, o come, o come, Emmanuel. Uh, the, the terms of discourse of the Zionist narrative infiltrate our literature, infiltrate our uh, Sunday school curricula, infiltrate our adult education uh, curriculum, dominate the biblical interpretation. Yeah. Uh, so that is, I mean, for me, the way in which the Bible is abused in this sense uh, is, is a big thing. There's no requirement, for example, to translate Eudaios and Eudaioi as Jew Jews. Uh, there's, it's, there, it, it's, it's misleading and it's, um, it's, uh, it's, it can do damage. So, you know, and there are better alternatives. So I, I would say those are the kind of things that we have to be careful of to make sure when people are, are uh, hearing these code words in our liturgies, in our biblical interpretation, in our preaching, whatever it happens to be, uh, that... Uh, if they're going to use the term Jew for the, somebody in the time of Jesus, understand it's not the same as the way we use the term Jew for somebody in the, in the 21st century. Uh, uh, you know, translate for people the meaning of Israel uh, so that they understand that it's not a, a nation state. It's education. It's, basic, it's fundamental education. Thank you. Alex? Yeah, fully agree with uh, Peter. And I would like to say... Uh, millions and millions of um, evangelical Christians, they conflate, you know, um, the modern state of Israel with the biblical Israel. And they assume 
that the modern state of Israel is just a continuation of ancient Israel. And so when they read, whether it's in the Old Testament or the New Testament, the word Israel, now what comes to, to their mind uh, quite often is this modern state of Israel, even though the modern state of Israel, modern state of Israel is totally secular. And um, many of its leaders and founders were totally atheists, have no faith in God or anything. But, but yet in the mind of our brothers and sisters in the churches, uh, they, they conflate uh, the ancient Israel with modern Israel. And uh, what is written in the Bible about uh, the ancient Israel, they assume it's also speaking about this current state of Israel. And that's why I agree totally with Peter that we need to uh, do a lot of educating and to help our brothers and sisters see the light on this issue. Perhaps you know that that might be a way to start. Uh, I, and I know every one of the pins in the denominations are taking this up in one way or another, but really looking at uh, education materials, prayers, liturgies, hymns, uh, uh, that, that's, that's a, a place of focus where we need to spend some time and energy. Uh, one last question, and then we'll get some closing remarks. We touched on this earlier, uh, Alex, you did earlier, but I'd like to tease it out a little bit more. Uh, manifest Destiny and American Exceptionalism, American Civil Religion. Uh, manifest Destiny and American Exceptionalism translates the theological language of election and chosenness, the chosen people to a Western narrative of human progress. I've written about this, that joins together American foreign policy, entrepreneurial capitalism, cultural Orientalism, and a Protestant Puritan spirituality in which America is viewed by Americans, as Alex pointed out before, as God's new Jerusalem or God's new Israel, whose mission is to civilize the world. Um, so talk about this a little bit, about the, how this biblical understanding of America uh, has shown itself throughout history and in America's self-understanding and in our so-called special relationship as a country to Israel. Alex, yeah. would you start with that? And then Peter, I'll ask you to wrap it up and then we'll go to closing remarks. Yeah, I mean, uh, whenever... Um you know, patriotism is high in the United States. Uh, you see this evidence, especially uh, after uh, September 11, the attack on the towers uh, during the Iraq war, uh, when uh, uh, America feels like in danger of invasion or something like this, uh, then you, you have a hype in uh, the American uh, culture where even secular U.S. citizens, uh, they, uh, uh, they, they start thinking, you know, uh, God bless America, you know, regardless of what America is doing in the world. Yeah, uh, and of course, we want God to bless America, but uh, my concept is God bless America, but don't forget the rest of your world. Uh, so uh, so th this is really sad because from one side, you have uh, evangelicals, Protestants, uh, charismatic people uh, in, in the millions who are supporting the uh, state of Israel and this alliance between the United States and Israel. And from the other side, you have secular people who are not religious. Uh, and yet, uh, because of their love to America and uh, the American dream and the American aspiration, they also uh, support, uh, uh, you know, the, the concept of the American empire and what the American empire is doing in the world and especially in the Middle East. Yeah, uh, thank you, Alex. Yeah, this idea of Western progress, uh, capitalism, Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East, you know, those kind of ideas all tend to kind of meld together in uh, uh, the um, uh, American civil religion, it seems to me. Peter, why don't you weigh in on this? Yeah, I understand it as a sort of uh, an, an ideology that legitimates or validates or promotes or reinforces 
uh, a, 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 a sort of a religious attitude based on entitlement, based on um, uh, privilege, based on achievement. And I don't see that in the Bible. I don't. I, I, I think that's also a, uh, like other things when related to our conversation today. It's based on a misunderstanding of texts. Um, I remember having a, a conversation with uh, one of our speakers. Well, the speaker was having a conversation with one of our groups, and this is uh, Rabbi Isaac New Newman. I don't know if you remember him, Alex, um, but he made a comment to our group. Uh, he said the Bible does not have anything uh, that says nothing about the concept of human rights and that shocked everybody because of course for us americans human rights is a is is, is fundamental almost to our to our uh, political identity but he went on to say that the bible is about human obligations obligations to respect one another to treat one another as we would want to be treated ourselves and so on and so forth so i i think it's important to uh to re-emphasize this concept of what are our obligations, uh, uh, what, what uh, prerogatives are, are incumbent upon us if we claim the name of Jesus, if we claim to be disciples. And I think that puts it, the conversation in a little bit different light and a more, more productive light. Instead of trying to find uh, how we are entitled, how we are privileged to comport ourselves, you know, we're the best, uh, you know, we're number one, all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, what are our responsibilities toward one another? How do we respond to the moral uh, uh, um, crisis that we see around us, whether it's interpersonal morality or international morality? Uh, it's really a question of how we are obliged by our Christian faith, by our biblical faith, uh, to conduct ourselves towards one another. Thank you, Peter. Um, <clears throat> I'm aware of the time. Uh, each, each one of the panelists, uh, uh, Peter and Alex, will be able to share a closing word. But before they do, I want to just remind you that this is the third of four programs in a series hosted by the United Church of Christ, Palestine Israel Network. The fourth and final webinar in this series, a human rights framework for a political solution, will be next Wednesday, February 2nd. 12 noon Eastern time. And it will feature uh, Reverend Lauren McGrail from the United Church of Christ Palestine Israel Network, former uh, mission partner at uh, the YWCA in Palestine for five years. Jonathan Kutab, a human rights uh, attorney um, who uh, is now the executive director of Friends of Sabil North America and who's re recently written a, a book about the one democratic state. And also Sahar Francis, uh, the executive director of the Adamir Prisoner Support and Human Rights Association, one of the six uh, uh, Palestinian NGOs that was uh, called a terrorist organization by the Israeli government. That's next Wednesday, February 2nd at 12 noon Eastern time. And UCC PIN will be, has been and uh, already and will be promoting that with the Zoom link to register. So with that, uh, Alex, uh, your closing thoughts. Well, first of all, uh, thank you, uh, Michael, and thank you, everyone, for listening to us. Uh, thank you, Peter, uh, for your wonderful uh, remarks. I learned a lot from you. Uh, and I would say Christian Zionism is very strong and uh, widespread, not only in the United States and North America, but also around the world. And uh, I believe the church uh, churches, uh, United Church for Christ, Methodist, Presbyterian, Lutherans, are the ones who bring hope to the Palestinian people in this struggle today, both to all Palestinians, Muslims and Christians. So I urge you as um, Christians from different denominations to step up and confront Christian Zionism wherever you, you can. Uh, it's it's a long battle, but I think uh, we will win this battle by your help. I, I really believe the church uh, can make a great contribution towards bringing peace and justice to Palestine. Thank you. 
Thank you, Alex, very much. And it's really always wonderful to see you and give that uh, new granddaughter a big hug and kiss from all of her adopted aunts and uncles here on the screen, okay? Sure, sure. <laughs> Tomorrow <you>. morning. <laughs> yeah, thanks. It's about one o'clock where you are in the morning, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Peter, uh, uh, your closing thoughts, please. Yeah, first of all, thanks. Uh, Thanks for the invitation to be here. It's a it's a it's a privilege for me to take part in this, and I appreciate all, he, having heard and learned so much again uh, from my friend Alex and Don. And uh, I hope it was as enjoyable and informative for the participants as it was for me. Um, I, I it, it's such an important topic. It it really is uh, uh, a difficult topic, but. Uh, I'm encouraged by things like this when I, when I realize that there are uh, small networks of people like this one connecting with other networks of other small networks to create uh, more of a movement. It's an extremely important thing for us to do among ourselves as mainstream Christians. Until now, not until now, but uh, mostly the conversation about Christian Zionism has focused on fundamentalists or on evangelicals. And that's convenient for us mainstream Christians. It's always easier to see other people's problems. Uh, but when we think about it, the concept or the phenomenon of mainstream Christian Zionism is overwhelming uh, compared to the fundamentalist or evangelical uh, 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 stream of it or, 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 or strand of it. Uh, think for a while, just uh, consider the numbers of the relative numbers of Christians and Jews in the world, Christians and Jews in the United States. If we understand Christian Zionism properly, not as something that requires a particular biblical interpretation, but as a, as a political ideology, we will realize that uh, uh, in America, to say nothing of the world, but in America, uh, Christian Zionists outnumber Jewish Zionists by at least 25 to 1. Absolutely. At least. At least. This means, uh, you know, consider also, but before there were Jewish Zionists, there were Christian Zionists. The idea was originally a Christian idea, a dispensationalist Absolutely. Christian idea. Even today, the ranks of Christian Zionists are, 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 are the ranks of Zionism are overwhelmingly populated by Christians in the world. That number is probably 85 to one. So I, I mentioned those things to stress how important it is to have these conversations among Christians, because we're really uh, that we give the power. We give the um, uh, the ideological legitimation to Zionism. And we're, dri we're driving. Problem. We're driving the Zionist bus. Yeah, we're the gas that fuels the engine. <laughs> is what it is, and it's it's you know I mean there there are for every fundamentalist Christian Zionist in the United States there are three mainstream Christian Zionists. So it's really it's a Christian phenomenon in general, but really it's a mainstream Christian uh, Christian phenomenon. So thanks for listening, everybody. I hope it was as informative and interesting for you as it was for me. Thanks again for the invitation. And I would encourage uh, um, everyone to take a look at uh, the Society for Biblical Studies website. Uh, Peter, you want to give a quick commercial? Uh, visit the website. Visit the website. We'd love to have uh, uh, 330 million uh, American travelers come to Palestine. With, with us, or with anybody for that matter. It would be a life-changing experience. Society for Biblical Studies, uh, Peter Miana. Well, folks, thanks to all of you for joining us today. I want to thank uh, my colleagues, Reverend Allie Perry and Reverend Lauren McRail, who really are responsible for organizing these webinars. Allie and Lauren, thank you. Thanks to the UCC PIN uh, Steering Committee, and thanks to all of you for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you next Wednesday for our final webinar. Thank you, everyone.